Hi, my name is Charles Malky, biologist and plant expert with Ivory Against, where, where we, we grow, grow cool, cool plants. plants. And today I've got two assistants, Isabel and Victoria, who are going to be helping me with planting tomatoes vertically. We're also going to be talking about planting your trees vertically and how to grow them in a way that will maximize on space so that you can actually fit more fruit trees in a limited footprint in your garden. So let's get started. Let's get started. So I'm going to give you all a quick tour of the variety of tomatoes I've got growing behind me. And in the meantime, I'm going to have Isabel and Victoria. Here's your dish. And I want you to fill them up with as many ripe tomatoes as you can. Good luck and fill up that dish with tomatoes. While they do that, come and check out these varieties of tomatoes. This first one over here is called the Super Sweet 100 variety of tomatoes. All the variety of tomatoes we have in this garden are known as indeterminate varieties. So the indeterminate varieties of tomatoes will continue to grow during the entire growing season, flowering and fruiting. And again, for what you plant in the spring, they'll typically peak and harvest by summer and typically die off by early fall, whereas your plantings that you do in summer will peak in the fall. And that's an important reason to continue planting outside of spring. Summer is still another good time to be introducing some more vegetables, especially if you live in a warmer climate as we do here in Southern California. So check out these tomatoes. Again, these are called the Super Sweet 100. And you can see how it got its name. It seems like every cluster of tomatoes is about 100. And it's growing on basically two vines. And I'm going to teach you how we're going to um, do that. And you can see that there's some twine here at the very top that's supporting these two primary branches. And all the other ones are simply pruned off like so. If you take a look here, you can see that there's some sucker growth happening on the side of this branch. And we'll simply twist that off and preserve. And here's another one. And we can simply preserve the two branches increasing aeration and light and that just results in maximum yields maximum size maximum quality on the remaining two vines instead of supporting you know 10 20 and upwards um, resulting in a more compact more dense and less healthy plant structure another thing i want to share with you as well as the girls if you take a look over here do you know what this is called isabel or victoria a caterpillar. you see a caterpillar right there does anybody know what that's called? A caterpillar. Take a look at that spine like on the back of its back. If you take a look right there, you can see that it's got a red fork right in the back, right? Like that's its tail. If you can get Victoria in there so she can take a look at it too. I'm trying to get a lot of light on there so you can really see Whoa. that caterpillar. Do you see that little red tail? Uh -huh. Do you guys know what this is called? called the tomato hornworm is the common name. So um, girls, do you happen to know what this caterpillar is going to grow to develop and become? Um, either a butterfly or a moth. A butterfly or a moth, and that's correct. This is going to grow to become what's known as a, commonly, as a hawk moth or a sphinx moth. And should we kill it or keep it? Keep, keep it. Keep it. Both of them vote keep it. And the answer is yes, keep it. Do you have any idea why we should keep the caterpillar on the tomato plant? Any guesses? So what is this caterpillar doing to your tomato plants? It's eating it. So Victoria says it's eating it. So what should we do? Should we keep it or kill it? Keep it. Keep it. Why would you want to keep it if it's eating your tomato plant? I mean, look at that. It's got a hole in the leaf right there. Why would you want to keep it if it's eating your plants? So Isabel said it's going to grow up to become a, 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 a moth or a butterfly. We've already identified that it's going to grow up to become a hawk moth, also known as the sphinx moth. And what is the moth going to do once this caterpillar grows up? Pupates, turns into its little cocoon, and then it's going to turn into a moth that's going to do what to the tomato plant? Any guesses? Eat it? No. Isabel, what does a moth do? What does a butterfly do to, um, when, it, when it visits a plant? What is it looking for? Good. And where is the nectar? In the? The flowers. In the flowers. So it's going to come and revisit the tomato plant, pollinate the flowers, which let me show you some flowers here. You can see here are the tomato flowers, the tomato hornworm moth, 
also known as the sphinx moth, also known as the hawk moth, is going to come visit these flowers, pollinate them, turn them into these beautiful green tomatoes that will eventually ripe fit into these beautiful red tomatoes that we'll finally get to enjoy. So there's this whole cycle of life that is happening. So if you see them, you know, consider keeping them and take a look at the overall health of this plant. That caterpillar is about a week, maybe not even two weeks away from pupating, at which point it will not be eating your plant and will quickly convert into um, becoming that moth. Take a look at the leaves. If you take a look at the leaves, they're in perfect conditions here at the bottom. There's a hole right here in this leaf and I'm going up and I can see that there's some damage over here and then I continue going up and there's like virtually no damage and hence no reason to do anything in your tomato plants leave this guy alone if it were covered in maybe you know five to ten and I saw significant damage I would simply hand pick it I would not resort to using even a um, organic pesticide to remove this guy as it's also going to take away from a lot of the beneficial life that's existing within your plants and it's necessary to have some pests in order to have successful predators in your garden such as your praying mantis and your ladybugs and all of these other good things that you want on your property so be very cautious of using any pesticides even organic when your plant is thriving and doing this good just leave it alone well, let me show you some more and girls continue picking So over here we have another variety of tomatoes known as the Juliet. As you can see, this is a Roma grape hybrid tomato, also an indeterminate grower. So again, it's going to continue growing and flowering and fruiting. If you start here at the bottom, you can take a look at these beautiful, what's known as the Juliet tomatoes, and check out these beautiful clusters of medium-sized tomatoes. This one here a little bit larger. And again, simply grown as two vines on this twine that is supported by the above trellis and let me share with you the third and final variety of tomatoes that we've got here in the garden and this one over here is known as the early girl again another indeterminate variety just to let you know the difference between indeterminate and determinant is that a determinant grows to a determinant size so whether it be three feet five feet or eight feet it grows quickly it flowers pretty much within a couple of weeks and all of the fruit will ripen within a short two to three week period of time compared to again the other value of the indeterminate variety of tomatoes is that you'll continuously harvest tomatoes over a larger growing season because it just continuously grows and continuously fruits and check out these tomatoes down here which the girls will be picking shortly so we got some beautiful again early grow variety tomatoes another medium variety and as you come up nice beautiful clusters of tomatoes all the way up and check out this tomato hornworm how huge is that this is literally a day to three days away from pupating I'm trying to get the sun on it so you can see it best and the way you identify it as you can see aside from the pattern you can see that horn on the tomato hornworm and again we're leaving this guy check out the leaves 99 percent perfect condition and even if it was a 90% even if it was an 80% condition it's still doing well performing flowering growing and this guy's doing very little like I said about 1% damage to this plant and there is value in keeping your tomato hornworms in your organic garden so we're gonna leave this guy alone and let me share with you now one of my first tips and lessons when it comes to planting new tomatoes come summer so as we mentioned earlier, it's important to continuously plant in your garden so that you can extend the harvest season within your growing zone. So our tomatoes, again, that we planted in the spring, we're harvesting peaking in the summer. What we plant in the summer will be peaking in the fall. So you'll have more continuous seasons of high harvest if you continuously plant throughout the growing season. And that's exactly what we're doing here today. So here we are now, mid-July, harvesting tomatoes. And thank you girls for doing that. And once we harvest the tomatoes we're also going to today be planting tomatoes so the tomato harvest is starting to peak here in the garden we're going to be planting new tomatoes so that we'll have another peak harvest happening in the fall and by the fall we're going to be ripping the original plantings from spring as the tomatoes behind me as great as they look will begin to die back and disease will begin to plague the plants by early to mid fall and especially as we get closer to winter rather than waiting for the entire cycle once we harvest a good 
you know, 70, 80, 90% of the tomatoes, we're going to take the plants out and then start with our fall plantings to capitalize on fall, which will put us in perfect time for an August, September, which is an excellent time to start planting a lot of stuff to keep your home garden looking green and extremely productive now going into winter. And some of the things that we're going to do, and if you take a look over here, this gift box over to my left is my seed exchange partner with She's Rooted Home Seed Exchange. And this is going out today to one of my seed exchange partners. And I'm going to be putting that link down below again for She's Rooted Home Seed Exchange where um, you're supposed to invest about $50 and it costs only $10 to join, and you'll be receiving gifts of approximately $50 in value. I'm just way excited um, to share with my seed exchange partner that I'm including pretty much all of these products, which are all Ivory Organics products, which includes the Ivory Organics 3-in-1 Plant Guard Protection Against Damaging Summer Sunburn Insects and Rodents, which the girls are going to be applying on the trees towards the end. The Ivory Organic Super Blend Fertilizer, All-Purpose Fertilizer, which includes all of the NPK plus the six macronutrients plants need, which includes calcium, magnesium, and sulfur, micronutrients, iron, among others, huge um, list of ingredients. It includes the Ivory Organics Ready to Use Spray Bottle. I'm going to be demonstrating how we're going to be using this on the tomatoes as well as the fruit trees. And then you're also going to be getting a copy of my book, which is Saving the World with the Home Garden and Improving Our Planet's Health with Natural Gardening Lessons. The general point in the early part of the book is that there is a right and a wrong way of gardening. And the goal is to educate people to do the right thing when it comes to their home garden so that they're doing something that's beneficial to their health, their community, and ultimately our one planet. And then for the seed exchange, I've got a ton of seeds. You're supposed to be exchanging five seeds and I think I've got like 10 or 15. And I want you girls to let me know that once the tomatoes come out, of these tomatoes, that of these seeds, which one would you like to integrate into your garden? Check these all out and pick one that you'd like um, to incorporate into our home garden. What's your favorite, Victoria? So she picked the nasturtiums, and the reason we've got nasturtiums in the mix and the value that nasturtiums offer the home garden is that they attract the white butterfly, also known as the cabbage moth. And these things will typically lay eggs on your cabbage for one, but also on a variety of other plants. And those caterpillars, just as we saw here with the tomatoes, will eat your leaves and, and cause some damage to your vegetables. And so by planting nasturtiums, you're basically attracting the white caterpillar moth to lay its eggs there. And the caterpillars will feed on the nasturtiums rather than feeding on the desired planted vegetables within your garden. So that's the value of nasturtiums. And Isabel, what do you pick? Uh, I like the carrot rainbow mix. Wonderful. So that's got a lot of color and and a lot of health benefits, a lot of nutrition, vitamins, good choice. Um, let me just share with you some other ones. I've always been planting California poppies here in my garden. Um, sugar peas are delicious, you know, way. And again, we've got this trellis system that's already in place. I'm thinking about adding also some peas into the garden. There's also some onions we can do. We can start planting here in the fall some radishes. The sunflower is going to be more of a spring planting. Cucumbers, spring. Tomatoes, spring. Um, beets fall and spring and here we got some more radishes fall and spring and then some beans this variety of beans the latest you should be planting it is August but notice that when it comes to your peas you can go January through March as well as September and so there's gonna be another window of opportunity to be planting these seeds and let me share with you another seed planting chart here that I got for Southern California that shares how much you can actually introduce into your garden right now. And then again, another reason to be promoting She's Rooted Home Seed Exchange. If you take a look here, you can see I grabbed this off of the Digital Gardener Southern California Vegetable Planting Schedule. And I put a check mark next to a lot of the seeds that I've included, which include beans, beets, carrots, onions, peas, radishes, and there's more. Check out all of this dark, these dark boxes or all of the seeds that you can be planting come fall, and then obviously in spring, there's a little bit larger of a window, but there's still plenty that can be done right here and right now. So again, as soon as these tomatoes are, um, you know, past their peak prime, which I would expect between August and September, we're going to take those out and begin our fall plantings with She's Read at Home Seed Exchange. And I'm putting that link down below so you can get connected to our next seed exchange opportunity and hoping to meet you guys all there. So I just trimmed this basil back. 
Can you imagine all the different meals we can make between these basil? Check out these tomatoes the girls helped me harvest. And then, I don't know if you guys can recognize this, but this is growing literally as a weed in several parts of the garden. This is called Purse Lane, and it's something I grew up with as a kid, and my mom integrated in a lot of our salads, as does now my wife. And um, I'm gonna be including a recipe on some of the dishes that we've enjoyed, one in particular being with tomatoes, this Purse Lane, avocado, lemons from the garden, among other um, vegetables and check that out in the description below this video um, so you can just get one of several ingredients that incorporate a lot of the things you can be growing in the home garden and bring all the health and nutrition directly from the sun into your body in a matter of hours compared to the things that are store-bought to go from field to store and then that time that it takes you know from your kitchen table to be prepared into a meal Again, there's nothing that supersedes the value and the health and the nutrition and knowing that you've grown these things in an organic, healthy way to go directly from sun and into your body, delivering all of these vitamins, nutritions, and health benefits to your body. Well, let me share with you one of my tips for starting your transplant tomatoes. Follow me. So just here at the bottom of the post are a couple of container tomatoes that we picked up from the nursery several weeks ago. You can see that these here are flowering and over here they're fruiting. But again, it's been a few weeks. Had they been planted and cared for properly, they would be at least two to three times bigger at this point. But I've been waiting for the right time to share this information with you. And if you take a look, my first tip to you is if you've got these container plants, the supplies for your container fruit trees and they're lying around your property, one of the safest place that you can keep them is in the soil and bury them about an inch or two into the ground. And what that'll do is for one, I've got a sprinkler that's right over here where I'm pointing, and that's just dripping some moisture in the area. I come with a watering can and make sure that these pots are watered. But what I've done here is I put them in the ground and you can take a look here under the wood chips. You can see that there's quite a bit of life here in the soil, but right in the ground, you can see that the roots are coming through and it's quite moist. And you can see the roots are coming through and this helps the plant better stay alive until we finally do something with it, whether it be repotting or planting them in the ground, that they're at least one or two inches in the soil as they will reap moisture and nutrients from the ground when you're neglecting the plants as I've done over the last few weeks. And let's see what's gonna happen over here once we pull this guy out as well. And we're coming through and you can see this one's actually really got its roots going through and that's pretty much what's kept this plant alive and thriving over the last few weeks well let's get to planting this tomato plant in the garden so tip number one is prepare the soil and what we're going to be doing as you can see here in the garden there's wood chips everywhere and we're gonna have to pull these wood chips back a few reasons for having wood chips in your garden is one in the summer it's actually keeping your soil cooler and in the winter it's actually doing just the opposite keeping your soil warmer and that blanket which is basically curbing weather extremes helps the plant better tolerate the growing environment that's two reasons and the third one is it helps suppress weeds if you take a look along this pathway you can see that there's very to little no weeds and i can assure you in the last three months i've picked no weeds and sure enough there are no weeds Mulching will help to suppress weeds by anywhere from 60 upwards to 90 and for me it's very close to 100%. And even if weeds do come through, they're usually very easy to pick through as they're growing through a bed of mulch compared to soil where the roots are better anchored. So a lot easier to do your weeding for the few weeds that do come through these wood chips, um, saving you time. A fourth reason is it helps retain moisture. You can see that I'm in an area where there's very little to no water. And as I dig through here, there's still some moisture that's being that's being trapped because the wood chips are absorbing and also trapping moisture and not at a hundred percent it's just helping the soil better retain moisture and that's at the end of the day helping you save water and that's saving money and last but not least and equally important is that the wood chips are also breaking down with each with each watering these wood chips are breaking down returning the elements that were once making up other plants and trees in the community and these are now breaking down and feeding all of the surrounding landscape whether they be trees vegetables roses or whatever it is that you're introducing these wood chips into your garden 
So the first thing I'm doing right now is peeling back the wood chips. I'm trying to make sure that as I prepare the digging hole that I'm not introducing wood chips at a deep level. So we're gonna just be pulling the wood chips back like so. Again, as these wood chips are breaking down, they're feeding the soil biology, which, in, which includes the earthworms as well as beneficial bacteria and as well as the mycorrhiza um, fungus, which is basically like your mushrooms. And even though you might not see mushrooms in the garden, the mycorrhiza are those, is that white network of hyphae or those roots that are coming off those mushrooms and networking all of the plants and trees within your garden. A single hypha or root off these mushrooms can span about a thousand feet compared to your tree roots that might be going 10, 20, 30, 50, even 100 feet, these mushroom roots can go 10 times further networking water and minerals throughout the garden. So another hugely important beneficial um, factor with your organic garden. We're now that we've peeled the wood chips back, we're gonna go with our shovel. And for those plants, I'm gonna go about a foot deep here. So now we're ready to plant the tomatoes. Victoria, what kind of um, tomato plant do you have? Candyland. So this one is called Candyland. And Isabel, what do you have? Super Sweet 100. Super Sweet 100, which is the tomato plant we started with. So Isabel and Victoria, which tomato plant would you like to plant? Candyland. Candyland. Candyland, it's unanimous. So let's get um, started. The first thing we're going to do, and I'm gonna help you with initially, is to basically thin this out. If you want to take a look over here, you can see here's a Candyland tomato. I always love growing indeterminate varieties. I'm trying to see if it says it somewhere here on this label. Um, usually you can read it. I think I already researched it somewhere that it is an indeterminate variety. I don't see that it's on the label. Um, and so the first thing we're gonna do is basically clean this up. The goal here is to grow a single to double stem. You can also do a triple. You can see that right now it's kind of growing into an out of control bushy um, structure, which is the way most tomatoes do in fact grow. But what I'm gonna do is try to thin this down to um, my top two branches. So you can see that I'm pulling out this branch over here. You can see this branch is going up. This one is thicker, this one is thinner. I'm gonna take the thinner branch out. And we're gonna to continue to remove all of those excess branches. I'm gonna have Victoria now remove as many of the leaves. So you can see here, now we've got one, two, three primary branches like coming out of the soil. I'm gonna take that second one out and now we've reduced it down to two. And this is pretty much how I've grown all the tomatoes here in my garden are as double stem tomatoes. Victoria, what I'm gonna have you do is now simply continuously remove the leaves going about halfway up. And the goal is to pretty much, if this wasn't such a huge structure, I would only leave the top two to three leaves and pretty much remove the stems. And the idea being is that you wanna plant tomatoes deep, pretty much unlike any other vegetable, including with fruit trees, and all fruit trees, you're predominantly looking at what the soil level is in the container, and you're gonna to wanna to make sure that when you put it in the ground that you maintain the same soil level, if not, maybe even an inch or two higher, as there's usually some settling that'll occur at the time of planting. But with tomatoes, the goal is to plant them deep as the stems will root, increase stabilization, and ultimately result in, again, the goal is maximum yields of tomatoes. So Victoria, what I'm gonna have you do, I'm gonna give you these lighter scissors, and if you want to now cut the leaves, but be very careful not to cut the stem, and you can go up to halfway up. And let's just do that, because my hole is not even, and I went fairly deep with the hole, but um, I think if you go about this deep, I'll be able to fit it all vertically in the hole, and we can get started. So if you just want to set that down right here next to the hole, right there, and show us all how you're going to remove those leaves. Good. Good. So the reason for removing the leaves is because the plant is now going to be planted deeper. You don't want all of those leaves, pretty much like the arms of the plant, to end up just rotting below the surface. And um, instead, it'll create a healthier plant that you simply prune those leaves off. You can use the leaves as a top dressing and it'll be part of the mulch. But to actually put it under the ground is just going to result in rot and it's not ideal to the plant to have all of those um, living plant tissues connected to the plant and rotting below the surface of the soil. So that's the reason we're removing the leaves before we plant it into the ground.
Good, let's go up a little bit higher. So remove a lot of those lower leaves all the way as close as you can to the stems. Good. Nice job. So the next thing I'm going to have you do, Victoria, is I'm going to have you now pull the tomato plant out of the container. So the way we're going to do this is I'm going to have you squeeze on the bottom of the plant. I know you're going to get your fingers a little dirty, and but I want you to... Um, this is your first tomato plant you've ever planted, right? Yeah. Yeah? So show me... Um, so what I want you to do is squeeze on the bottom of the container to loosen those roots. So squeeze hard. Squeeze, squeeze, squeeze. Good. And that's going to actually loosen the soil around the tomato plant. Good. And now I want you to put your hands on top of the soil right here so that the plant doesn't fall out when you tip it over. So put your hands like that over the soil. Now spin it upside down. Turn it, turn it, turn it. Good. Yeah, right like that. That's what I usually do. Right over the um, hole. And now tap on the bottom. Let's go tap, tap, tap. And now see if you can actually pull the container off. Oh, you did. Good job. Way to go. The reason I didn't think it was going to come out quite so easily is because of all of these roots that were growing through those holes. Now, show the camera all of those coiled roots. It's been, again, several weeks in the container plus the weeks it's been sitting at the nursery before we bought it. And these roots have really coiled up. If we just stick it in the ground, the roots will begin to flare out, but there's going to be a mass of roots that's going to be there for the life of the plant. We've already pruned a lot of these leaves, so that's going to offset a lot of the plant's shock by reducing the plant structure. So now we're going to throw it into another shock being, I want you to rip all of these roots off. So with your fingers, I want you to go in there and rip all of the soil, all of these roots off that are coiled. So, and what we're doing is, is a phenomenon known as root pruning. So can you rip those off? Are those, are those roots stronger than you or are you stronger than those roots? I think I'm stronger. See if you can like pull them apart. Pull as much as you can. And then I'm going to have Isabel help you. Just pull it. Good. So that root that is coming off to the side, we can actually take the scissors and cut that out. So keep going. Keep trying to pull those roots apart. Good. You want Isabel to help a little bit? Yeah. Yeah? Okay, Isabel, come on in. Show, show the camera how you're going to rip those roots apart. Oh, yeah, so she's using the muscular part of her hands, getting her fingers in there. Oh, you did it. I was ready to use some scissors, but she's done this before, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. Pretty good. So now you can see those cold roots. Are those roots coiled anymore, Victoria? No. No, they're not. Isabel? No. Nope. We fixed it, right? So now when the roots grow, they're going to grow deep and out, which is what we want them to do. So, Victoria, if you want to plant that now in your tomato planting hole, let me actually remove some of um, that soil near the bottom. So here you go. You can put it in as deep as you can go. Look at that. Great job. So what we're going to do next is I've got over here some compost. So what I'm going to have you guys do and get your hands a little bit more dirty before we do, if you can pull some of those leaves aside as we're going to use it as a top dressing. So Isabel, come over to my side now. And what I'm going to have you do is take just a handful of compost from this bin, mix it with the native soil that we've excavated out of this um, planting hole, and then we're going to mix this with your hands back and backfill the planting hole with the tomato in it. So just take one handful. The reason in a lot of planting methods will recommend that you do a 50-50. 50% compost with 50% native soil. The reason we're not doing that, you can continue, Isabel. The reason we're not putting too much compost, you can mix it into the, you're gonna mix it into the native soil and then backfill it into the hole. Right, so I go like this? Correct, like you're gonna mix it and then push it into the hole. So we're offering the plant some compost. It's loosening the soil somewhat, even though we're dealing with some pretty good soil as we have been mulching here in the garden. And mulching is one of the number one ways to improve both clay soil as well as sandy soil is mulch. And it will improve the whole soil dynamics and improve the soil diversity and biology. Um, so we've got some pretty good soil to begin with, but we're adding just a handful. And even if you've got the worst soils, don't put so much compost into the planting hole as much as you'll be adding in the topsoil as it otherwise would occur in nature. Um, 
So we're going to continue. Um, keep backfilling. Do I put more of this or no? You can put like one more handful, but the goal is we're not striving to do a 50-50 mix. Your, your compost that you're adding into the planting hole should be no more than about 10% tops, and that applies with most of your um, plantings. For your tree plantings, be extra cautious and careful. As with your tree plantings, if you're adding too much compost, the concern is that it's gonna settle, and now the plant's gonna be a little deeper in the planting hole, and that'll result in a phenomenon known as stem rot, as the soil um, basically backfills along the tree trunk of the plant. And so Isabel's continuously um, backfilling. I'm now gonna use this tool to help pull the rest of the native soil back and into this planting hole. Good job, Isabel. So now, Isabel, I'm going to have you take another handful of compost. Victoria, if you want to reach in there too, grab some compost and put it around the top of the plant. And now you can add virtually as much as you want. As a top layer, this is, again, the way it would occur in nature. So the goal is to put the compost in the top soil, in the top layers, as it otherwise would occur in nature. In nature, if you go down past those first few inches, you might, you know, there's going to be beneficial bacteria, there's going to be those earthworms grabbing the nutrients from the topsoil and pulling them down into the deeper layers of the sand, silt, and clay that comprises of most soils. So again, we're improving the, the, the topsoil so that with each watering, those nutrients are coming down and, and basically feeding that entire root zone of the plant. So um, good job with the compost there. If you want to stand up real quick, the next thing I'm going to do is bring some fertilizer into the planting zone and so the next thing i'm going to do is now add the ivory organics i'm using the super blend there's also the premium blend fertilizers which has a lower npk but this one has a 13 14 13 um, npk nitrogen phosphorus potassium as well as as we mentioned at the beginning it's also got macronutrients calcium magnesium and sulfur in addition to and just check out all of those ingredients that um, go into the product and what we're going to do here is i'm simply going to be scattering some of the product around the topsoil of the plant, like so. And I'm now going to just take my hand tool here and mixing that into the top half an inch of soil. And then Victoria, with your hands, I'm going to have you now backfill the original wood chips that we had. And if you can pull that back over and around the plant, like so. And Isabel, if you want to help as well, if we can backfill some of these wood chips, if you can get also the clippings of the tomatoes, you can also use that around the plant as mulch around the plants as well. As these will all break down, returning the elements and the nutrients that made up those stems and leaves back into the soil. That's wonderful. And notice how we put it as a top dressing so that it can break down and, um, and basically feed the plant, whereas if it was buried, it would rot. But near the top, where there's plenty of oxygen, it's not gonna rot. And again, it's gonna serve the same function as a mulch around the plant. So girls, any guesses as to what the next step's gonna be? Watering. Watering. So I've got a watering can over here. Who would like to do the watering? Me. Okay, Victoria, the watering can is yours. Hopefully it's not too heavy. Oh, wow. Can you do it? And here we go, water the plant. Good job. The job on watering a plant is to make sure that you water it deep every time you go to watering the plant. If you're on a sprinkler system or whatever systems you're using for watering your plant, just make sure that on your watering days, you water the entire root zone, not just that top inch not just that top two inches, but you wanna soak the plant and then not water the plant again until the soil is dry, but never bone dry. And that's a pretty good rule of thumb pretty much for all of your planted plants, whether they be trees or vegetables or even your container plants, is to just make sure that they're never bone dry, but also never continuously wet. So good job with the watering. It's getting lighter, isn't it? Uh -huh. Yeah, you did it. There's still one more thing we're gonna do. Any guesses, girls? So what else are we going to do? There's one more step. The, the whitewash it. We're going to whitewash the plant, right Victoria? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so now we're going to basically use this product over here, which is the Ivory Organics 
The Marine One plant guard protection against damaging sunburn insects and rodents. Rodents for use on your roses, fruit, nut trees, ornamental trees, and shrubs for use in organic production, healthier than latex paint, tar-based products. And the goal is we're going to simply now spray it. And Isabel, I'm going to give you the honors of spraying this now on the plant. And you just do it on the leaves, right? Say that one more time. You just do it on the leaves? Yeah, so you're just going to be basically spraying the leaves. You can also spray the stems. Nice job. And now I'm hoping the camera will capture if you take a look. And the light is not necessarily you know strong right now on the plant. But you can take a look that there should be like a milky film um, protection that will dry pretty close to clear but still offering some sunscreen protection to the plant. The benefits the product offers as we sprayed it on the plant is it shows over here as a sunscreen. In the summer it's offering sunburn, um, summer sunburn protection. In the winter, winter sun scald protection. Uh, you know, for premature blooms, that application is more so like on your fruit trees. By whitewashing it, the plant will stay cooler and bloom later in the season rather than in those false warm winter days for prune and grafting wounds as an anti-transparent. This is actually the predominant reason we're using it today. Um, increasing cloning success, with, we're not cloning, but reducing transplant shock, absolutely. We do want to reduce transplant shock, being that we've ripped the roots in half. We've stripped half the leaves off the plant. It has been a traumatic day on this tomato plant. And whitewashing the entire plant structure as we did today is definitely gonna help the plant off to a great start and also keep it insect and rodent free. The predominant thing is we don't want the plant, um, insects to eat the plant, especially at the small stage. And the way the insects are gonna stay away from it is if we take a look here at the active ingredients, is that it includes castor and garlic and cinnamon, um, which are proven ways of repelling and keeping insects from eating your plant, in addition to diatomaceous earth. And diatomaceous earth is also highly beneficial in repelling most pests off your plants. So. Um, if anything comes to chew on it, it's not going to want to consume the entire plant. As soon as it hopefully takes a bite, it's going to want to look for something else. And that's how the Ivory Organics 3-in-1 Plant Guard offers as a repellent protection against most insects as well as rodents. So the next thing we're going to do is stake it. And this is going to be what's going to train the vines to grow as we've done over there in a vertical fashion. So I'm simply taking the stake. I'm basically putting it into that loose planting hole that we just created. We're going to take our twine here. And we're simply throwing it over like so. And these two twine will now support the two vines to create that double stem tomato that we're going to be accomplishing. Within about a week or two, these stems will be closer to this area and we can start training them to grow up in vertically. Within a few short months, you're gonna be enjoying a six to eight foot tall structure. And again, on simply two twines, creating a double vine tomato. And again, just keep your eyes up for suckers. As you can see, there's always gonna be some sucker growth happening. And you're simply going to wanna to be pinching that additional growth or simply using your scissors pinching that additional growth out of the plant. The next thing I want to share with you is in regards to growing also your fruit trees in a limited garden space. So let's go back to that corner of the property. Follow me. So the next thing we're going to do is whitewash our fruit trees and that includes our dragon fruit which this one over here we got from Edgar Valdivia's garden known as the George and that is a beautiful red dragon fruit with a white flesh and then just here behind me if you can see over this branch are three other varieties of dragon fruit which include purple red yellow um, four different varieties of dragon fruit that we planted with tahita of the citrus and avocado growers of America Facebook and I'm going to be putting that link down below as well for you and um, just to let you know with Edgar Valdivia, this particular dragon fruit, Edgar Valdivia is known as, um, as well as being a member of the California Rare Fruit Growers, as the, the leading 
educator and promoter of dragon fruit of the modern era. And so I'm very proud to have this from his garden, being able to you know sample and enjoy the deliciousness um, of his fruit and now having it here in our home garden for our children to enjoy as well, hopefully in the upcoming year. And I'm hoping also in the upcoming week or two, having also Richard Lee of the famous Dragon Fruit YouTube channel. I'm going to be putting that link down below as well as I'm hoping to have him here in my garden and bringing um, some excellent varieties that all of us should be considering um, having in the home garden as well. So I'm looking forward to having Richard Lee of Grafting Dragon Fruit YouTube channel here in our home garden as well in the upcoming week. So be sure to check that out by subscribing today. So before we get to um, caring for our fruit tree over here to the left, which is a Zager variety of plum known as the Plua, and we just did a sampling off of that just a few weeks ago. We've harvested the fruit, one of the most delicious tasting fruit trees I've ever tasted known as the Dapple Supreme and the flavor Supreme Plua. So two amazing, delicious varieties of Pluots um, that have cross-pollinated naturally, just as tomatoes between maybe a cherry and a beefsteak can cross-pollinate and create more of a medium-sized tomato. All natural, non-GMO fruit tree that's here on our property. And what we're gonna be doing again is using that IV organic three-in-one plant guard. And I've already got people asking me in regards to the dragon fruit, they're burning in the summer heat, especially your newer planted ones. They're you know changing from green to yellow. And what I wanna share with you, and this is a dragon fruit I've taken out from an area that only gets a few hours of sun. And now here it's going into a full sun location. It's gonna be growing alongside this particular post here in the garden. And I'm gonna have Isabel protect what I like calling the heart of the tree. And we're gonna demonstrate this on the plow out behind me as well. But what we're gonna do is protect the tree trunk, which again, this is doesn't necessarily you know grow as a fruit tree typically would but we're going to protect the lower part of the tree by whitewashing that stem so isabel and victoria if you want to dip your brushes into the product and again i just want to share with you while they're doing that here's the ivory organics um three in one plant guard protection from damaging sunburn insects and rodents it's got these oils which serve as an insect repellent castor cinnamon cloves garlic peppermint rosemary and spearmint in addition to these inert ingredients which include diatomaceous earth which also offers some insect repellent protection. If the insects and rodents are not necessarily an issue, there's also the ivory against whitewash oil-free formulas, which may be ideal for that too. So girls, be sure not to go past halfway up the stem. The goal is we're making sure that at least that part of the plant is not gonna get burnt, while the rest of the plant will be exposed to the sun, photosynthesizing, making all of the sugars and minerals and vitamins. Don't go too high. Yep, only go up halfway, and that's gonna protect the plant. Have you um, finished doing that so far? Almost. We only have one more side to go, I'm pretty sure. Okay, so let's um, spin that around. Here we go. Let me get through. And just to let you know while they wrap this up, the reason that we're using the Ivory Organics 3 one Plant Guard rather than using a um, paint from the big box stores is that paint's designed to last 100 years. Ivory Organics is Omri listed for organic gardening so that as the plant continuously grows and it sheds that outer layer um, that you don't end up with paint that's going to last 100 years in your soil and instead you've got a product that's derived from and check out these ingredients which include iron oxide which controls the color as you can also do it in brown and green if you're looking for a more natural look limestone mica which is like clay milk which are the proteins that help create a bond that lasts about as long as paint and then silica, and then that methyl cellulose, which is a gummy um, you know, outer layer of the cell walls, as well as diatomaceous earth, which we just talked about. So now that they finished painting, the second and last thing we're gonna do here to this dragon fruit is we're going to spray it just as we did the tomatoes. So by spraying it, what we're doing is also creating a nice sunscreen protection. Victoria, if you wanna scoot back so you don't get sprayed. And let's whitewash the entire now plant structure. I spray the whole thing? Yeah, spray the entire plant. There you go. Exactly. So now the entire plant has protection from damaging sunburn. And again, the other thing that um, distinguishes this product from a box store paint is that it doesn't have latex and it doesn't block the pores. The plant can still breathe. You can still offer the plant um, you know, nutrition that can go right through the product to the plant and the plant can also breathe. And also um, it won't be trapping moisture leading in rot on pruned surfaces. So all of that's um, being offered to the plant. And now let's go and visit um, the Zager genetic um, Pluot that we got to enjoy earlier this year. And it's now time to shape it and prune it and let's go and do that together to make it more of a compact structure to better fit the home garden. Follow me. 
So here we are now again with our Dapple Supreme Plua, a Zager Genetics non-GMO hybrid fruit tree, which is exclusively sold and made available through the Dave Wilson Nursery. And we're fortunate and so lucky to have Tom Spellman, who invited us to visit the Zager Orchard. And Isabel got to come with me and we got to sample 29 different fruits that were in the Zager orchard just last year and um, this was one of our favorites that we got to um, sample and we brought it here to the home garden as well but what we're going to want to do now is i want to structure it again to fit our very compact backyard orchard and what i want to share with you while i work on shaping it is i'm going to have the kids continue protecting what i like calling the heart of the tree and the heart we define as being the tree trunk and the lower branches so if you take a look here when isabel and i planted this tree about eight months ago you can see that we whitewashed the plant as soon as we planted it which is supposed to be um the lesson when planting a tree. You plant it, you fertilize it, you care for it, but you're also supposed to whitewash it to protect the tree trunk from burn. But you can see that since we planted, the tree has expanded quite a bit with all of these, what appears to be cracks in the bark, is actually the plant expanding. And now we're gonna continuously protect the tree trunk as we now thin the canopy of the plant, allowing more light in to avoid the risk of first, second, and third degree burns. And I've demonstrated an example a few years back with an orange tree that was pruned in spring and by summer in a matter of months it experienced third degree burns and i've shared that video um, with you guys a few times in the past but what we're going to do again is protect the tree trunk and the lower branches and again if there's any damage that happens higher no big deal we can prune it new branches will be created but if there's damage at this low as i like calling again the heart of the plant then we're going to end up shortening the overall health and life of the tree so girls if you want to um, begin whitewashing the the plant structure while i while i now discuss shaping and pruning the plant to better fit this home orchard one of the things we learned from tom spellman is the idea of backyard orchard culture which among the many lessons of backyard orchard culture is to make sure that the fruit are within reach and within pick and right now here we are in july and most people would not think about summer pruning but all of this growth that is out of reach and i can reach about eight feet I say this plant is closer to like 12 to 14 feet tall now. And when we planted it, it was closer to about five feet tall. And again, this was about eight months ago. So you can see how much growth we've got to enjoy in such a short period of time. And what I wanna share with you is anything that I cut that's within reach. So my reach is again, eight feet. If you take a look here at the buds, you'll see that right in each leaf node is a bud and these buds are gonna create the flowers for next year. So here we are in 2020, these will be the flowers for 2021 spring and the flowers will ultimately result in the fruit. So everything that I prune within reach will end up being fruiting within reach even if the plant ends up growing taller. Whatever I end up pruning before the end of this year will flower and fruit in that same region by next year. So I've gotta make the decision on you know how high I want the fruits to be the other lesson I want to share with you, and just as we use the twine to um, basically shape the um, growing direction, I'm going to be using twine right now to shape the direction of these branches. If you come in a little closer over here, what I want to share with you is here's the tree trunk, and the girls are doing a great job now protecting the tree trunk. We're going to we're going to go up a little bit higher. Isabel and Victoria, if you want to see how high my hands are, kind of want to go up to about this area, which will protect the tree trunk and the primary lower branches of the tree. But this branch over here, which is coming off to the side, is growing towards the house. And if you take a look behind me, just over my right shoulder, you can see that there's a pathway. And the goal is I want these trees to kind of be fanning, like peacock feathers in an open and very flat, almost in a spally way, as if you're training it against the wall. But I don't necessarily need to keep it that flat, but I do want the primary branches stretched um, in a flat and along the path fashion and if it grows a little wider that's fine but i just don't want the branches this early on pointing in the wrong direction especially this beautiful almost as thick as the primary leader i don't want it pointing in the wrong direction so this is an excellent time to now train it and i've got this lattice um, structure that i'm using for the tomatoes that i can also now use to train these branches in the directions that i want it and whatever i do now within the next six you know, six months to eight months will actually end up being in a permanent position, kind of like braces would be on your teeth. And so what I'm going to do now is take some twine and now start training the branches in the direction I want. So here we are. We just 
secured some twine against that lattice which is um, supporting the passion fruit out in the um, far back we're now taking this twine i'm gonna cut it and this should be sufficient right here and i'm now going to train this branch again the goal is to grow out in a peacock fan fashion and That'll go right there like that. We're being careful not to put a knot against the tree trunk as we don't want to constrict. The underlying under the bark is a layer known as the cambium layer. We want to make sure we're not constricting the cambium layer which moves the water and sugars um, throughout the plant. And then we're just gonna secure that like so. If we want to continuously open the plant, we can, continue, we can also train more of these branches to open in the design that we want, especially while these branches are young. First, second, and third year branches are very easy to train in whatever direction you want, especially if you're looking to create an espalier um, type tree, maybe grown against the wall, or just an espalier, like I like calling in, as we've done our Meyer lemons, in what I call a freestanding espalier. And that's kind of what we're doing here. We're making sure that it's fanning in the direction of our pathways on both sides of the tree. And now I'm gonna take my bypass pruners and basically shape the canopy so that its resources rather than going into those excess branches will be going more into the fruiting zone of the plant so now i'm going to take my bypass pruners and basically prune the plant to grow again in a way that most of the fruit are going to be within reach so we're going to start off with this branch over here you can see that it's um, branching out quite low and here's another branch where it's forking out but this is almost like a little bit too high so i'm going to bring it down to this spot right here. Check out all of this height that we've taken off the plant. And we're gonna continue like so. This branch over here is growing towards the center of the canopy and so I'm actually not gonna allow this and I'm gonna prune right below it. What I've done is I pruned about a quarter of an inch away from the nearest bud this bud will now swell and more likely than not begin to grow for the next few months. Here we are again in July. This plant will continuously grow through August, September, October, and more likely than not enter dormancy between November and December. So even though it looks like this plant may be done growing, there's actually still a lot more months of growing as you can see in this grow zone over here. And now by pruning it, I'm gonna be encouraging growth where I want it, which is gonna be in the lower canopy, creating more branches and ultimately more buds, which are gonna result in more fruit and all within a manageable, reachable area. And that's it. We just summer pruned our fruit tree. And again, this is another important time and an important lesson. A lot of university studies um, that substantiate and back this up is that when you summer prune, it's entering more lights into the understory of the tree. Another important reason to be whitewashing and protecting your tree trunk and primary branches. creating a fan-shaped, freestanding espalier. And then we're just gonna take the Ivory Gang 301 plant guard to keep beetles and termites entering these pruned surfaces. And again, the product dries on porous, which is healthier than if it were to trap moisture, resulting in rot behind its surfaces. So if you've enjoyed this educational lesson brought to you by our Veganics, be sure to give us a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe and hit the push bell notification to stay connected to all of our educational lessons as soon as they become made available. As always, keep growing with Ivory Organics and wishing you all. Happy, Happy gardening. gardening. Happy gardening.